Hello, everyone. My name is John Irons, and I'm a visiting scholar at the Schwartz Center for Economic Policy Analysis here at the New School. I'm here with Jessica Pisano, who is an associate professor of politics at the New School. She writes and teaches about contemporary and 20th century politics in Eastern Europe. And we're joined by several students here in the economics department at the, at the New School. We wanted to have this conversation today for a couple of reasons. First, as a Center for Economic Policy Analysis, we also recognize the importance of power and politics in setting an economic policy agenda. And second, as we all know, this is an unusual election. COVID has challenged our electoral systems with increased mail-in voting and early voting, but it is also unusual in that there are those in power who have aimed to reduce access to polls, to cast doubt on the election results, and to sow disinformation, all in an attempt to influence the outcome. And we thought it might be worthwhile to learn about how elections have been manipulated in other countries, so we might be able to understand better what is happening during the current US election. And we thought that Professor Pisano's research and perspectives would be extremely valuable at this moment. So Professor Pisano, thank you for joining us. Thank you, it's a great pleasure to be here. I appreciate the invitation. Yeah, great. Um, and so first, can you just tell us a little bit about your research into elections in Eastern Europe, including Russia and Ukraine? How do you approach the issues and, and what have you found? Sure, so um, I did, on the ground research studying the underlying political economy of electoral manipulation in Ukraine and in Russia over um, a space of about 15 years. Um, so starting in about 2000, we started to see many of the same techniques that are now emerging in the United States being uh, put into widespread use in those two countries. Um, I was studying other things at the time, uh, property rights uh, and economic relations, but it, as it turned out, it was very difficult to separate um, those unfolding processes from electoral processes. So that's where that interest comes. Um, so uh, I've just finished a book about that. And one of the places where I conducted the research for that book um, and where I got it really an up close and personal look at those techniques was in Eastern Ukraine, uh, which as you may recall, was the playground of former president of Ukraine, uh, Viktor Yanukovych and his election consultant, Paul Manafort, who as you know, went on to run the Trump campaign. So um, I'm very excited to speak with you today, not just about sort of resonances and similarities, but also um, techniques for which we know that there are known conduits of information about tactics. So tell me a little, about, a little bit more about those techniques. Um, like, is there a playbook that's used? Um, just tell me just a little bit more about how this is actually done from a practical perspective. Sure. So um, now there's been a lot of discussion in the media about disinformation, right? And we've heard about trolls and bots and uh, activity on social media. Um, I'd like to turn our attention to, um, to the material world uh, today in our discussion. It's not to say that the disinformation isn't incredibly important in um, forming people's preferences. There are also other things going on here um, and other things we should be on the lookout for in the United States. Um, both because they've been used very effectively in Eastern Europe and, um, and also because uh, sociologists and political scientists in the United States have started to notice their use here, um, beginning even um, going as far back as 2000. So, um, so these techniques um, have been successful in Eastern Europe. Um, and they are not really about preference formation, right? So if we talk about disinformation, we're talking about changing the way people think. Um, the techniques that are really used the most in Eastern Europe aren't about um, trying to show people how they could think a different way. They're showing people how to act a different way. Um, and very often they're playing with people's in economic insecurity and using that insecurity to get, to get them to vote for incumbents. Um, in the contemporary context in the United States, this is really important because the pandemic provides an ideal setting for those tools, right? People are experiencing food insecurity. Um, many people who still have their jobs may fear being laid off. The, the hallmark of manipulation in Eastern Europe is politicians taking things that people used to take for granted, whether those are food, pay, access to healthcare, access to transportation, and so on, and using those things to entice or compel people to vote for incumbents. So um, some examples of attempts by the Trump administration slash campaign, because there's increasingly um, not as uh, clear a difference between those two things as we're accustomed to in American politics, might include, um, for example, recently uh, the president um, 
had included a letter from him in the Farms to Families Food Box program. It's a program that has di distributed about 100 million um, boxes of food to um, families in need since, uh, since the spring. And now those boxes contain a letter from the president. Um, you know, identifying uh, his efforts to try to help them. I mean, for specialists in Eastern Europe, when we saw this, I think people's blood must have run cold or people may have laughed because this is absolutely the number one staple approach of, um, of bringing people into the, to the ballot box uh, in Russia and Ukraine and other places. Um, boxes that include things like buckwheat oil, um, cookies, you know, sort of staple foods are, are very often uh, distributed, uh, not only in those countries, but elsewhere in the world as well, as we know, um, to try to entice people to the, po to the polls. Um, we can speak more about other, uh, other techniques of this type, type, but what I'd like us to sort of point to now is that these techniques add up to something, right? They're not just tactics. Over time, they have produced in Eastern Europe a conceptual shift in how people think about the meaning of elections, right? So people go from thinking about voting as an expression of what people want or believe and uh, to voting as a ritual that gets people what they need, right? So uh, this is one way to see the Trump campaign's use of a well-known Rolling Stone song at his rallies, right? Um, rallies which are really pretty highly sophisticated political influence operations, right? So um, I think it's important for us to understand that uh, even though some people might critique the administration for ineptitude and in governance, um, we really wanna pay attention to what the administration, uh, like other administrations that, uh, that the president admires, um, actually care about. And it's not clear that governance is what they care about, right? They're, they may be after other things and they're pretty good at getting what they want. Right, so this is what we see in Eastern Europe. There's a, politicians get what they want and people um, vote in order to get what they need. And they do this by participating in these tactics that bring them to the polls. Um, yeah, I think that's really interesting. I think oftentimes when we think about elections here, it's left, right, it's Republican, Democrat. It's less about incumbency and non-incumbency, mm -hmm. except to the extent that every once in a while it's a change election in a way that it's, a um, little bit feels like that, but say a bit more about that incumbency piece. Um, sure. Like how did it shift from a left right to an incumbency versus not incumbency? Well, I mean, th this is a sort of, I think, um, this is a relatively better known aspect of uh, the ways in which so-called illiberal regimes uh, seize power, right? They come to power through democratic elections, which may involve some degree of manipulation, but are generally competitive. And then once in office, the institute reforms, which make it very difficult to move them out of office. Um, in the case of the Trump administration, um, I, I think Americans need to be very aware of a recent executive order, which essentially politicizes um, the state bureaucracy at the federal level. Right? Uh, it gives the presidential administration the ability to um, fire people um, if they, uh, for, for different reasons. This uh, type of reform has been implemented in Eastern Europe um, in order to politicize the bureaucracy, which then can be weaponized to, uh, in the context of elections. So, um, so if, uh, if we wanna talk about how this actually works on the ground and how incumbency then becomes sort of the salient um, factor in, in elections, um, let's look at, uh, you know, a Ukrainian or a Russian election. So, uh, you know, how does this work? An incumbent president needs support in a battleground region, let's say, right? So someone in the presidential administration calls a governor's office and says, you know, we really need your support in this election. If the government want, if the governor wants that new factory or uh, some tax break or some benefit that the federal or central government can offer. So in the current context, we could imagine um, with all of the costs that the uh, runaway spread of, um, of uh, COVID has generated for state budgets, um, state budgets really need um, money back from the federal government in order to fund schools and um, police and all of these other functions of government. So um, this was the case also in Eastern Europe, particularly in the years following the, uh, the fall of the Soviet Union where state budgets were really strained. 
So the president, the incumbent would get in touch with the regional administration and say, we need your support. And then the regional administration mobilizes people um, in their, their um, jurisdiction to deliver a certain number of votes by exerting pressure on public sector employees and employees of private enterprises that receive certain benefits. Um, through the government. So they're not trying to change people's minds. They're trying to change their voting behavior. Um, and this goes sort of all the way down. They're parasitic on existing hierarchies. So if we want to take universities as an example, um, what would happen notionally in this kind of situation is, you know, the president would call uh, a governor, the governor calls the uh, president of the university, or not the governor, but one of his um, people calls the president of the university. The president of the university lets the employees know that um, the students need to uh, vote for and turn out at demonstrations for the incumbent um, if they want to uh, get good grades, if they want to keep their scholarships, if the university is going to keep its access to federally funded uh, financial aid. Um, and so this is sort of, it uses these existing, so these, these existing institutions. So it's actually very cheap for, um, for politicians who want to use incumbency in this way, if there are no barriers to that. Um, so this type of manipulation, uh, Russians refer to as pressure or administrative resource, is, is parasitic on these institutions. And incumbent politicians use their, the power of their office to manipulate uh, electoral outcomes. It's only used by incumbents. This is why in the United States, we have the Hatch Act, right? Which the Trump administration has really repeatedly and openly uh, violated. Um, so it's important to remember as Americans head into the post-election period that although we are likely to hear accusations of the use of this type of tactic um, by the president about the Democratic Party, this is really only a set of tactics that's available to uh, parties of power, that is to say parties that are in office. It, it's not a set of tactics that the Democrats currently have um, at their disposal. So I'm, I'm curious, is this done explicitly? Like are, are the phone calls just saying like, I need X number of votes or is it kind of like a wink and a nod? It'd be great if something could happen. So I'm kind of curious like that, that chain of command, if you will, is it implicit or is it just really explicit? Here's what you need to do. Um, so it's both uh, in different times and at different places, depending on the actors. Um, you know, there are cases um, where there is a written trace um, and it's in the documentary record. Much more often though, uh, it is a wink and a nod. There's a, there's a word in Russian and Ukrainian for this, ponyatsya or ponyatsya, um, that even made it into a song in Ukraine uh, during the so-called Orange Revolution in 2004. The people said, you know, no more ponyatsya, right? No more winks and nods. Um, for Americans, maybe the best way to think about this is a sort of um, the kind of mob boss model we're all familiar, familiar with from popular culture. Um, you know, like it'd be terrible if something were to happen to your family, um, right? Uh, so, uh, and, and sometimes it's a suggestion, right? It's important to also draw a distinction between the United States and countries in Eastern Europe here because in Eastern Europe, these systems once established were so pervasive that everybody understood what was being asked of them, right? So that when, um, a student or an employee is told, you know, there's a presidential election coming up and the president really needs our support. Um, people know to read that as uh, you need to vote for this person or there will be consequences. Whereas it's not clear that for Americans, that context is quite the same. And so the power of suggestion um, is not as well uh, developed, right? Sort of that kind of signaling um, needs to be much more explicit for Americans to understand it. That having been said, um, you know, I, in the early 2000s, I was present in contexts where I heard uh, very explicit uh, demands, you know, as in, you know, this, you know, I was working on uh, former collective farms at the time doing research and uh, would hear things like, you know, if you want uh, that diesel, you know, you need to deliver these votes. Right, um, so, so it can be both, but I think it's important for, um, for us to understand uh, in the context of US elections that um, there's not necessarily always going to be a smoking gun, right? Uh, in terms of evidence of this taking place, it's, that's not generally the way it works. Hmm. Great, thanks, that's, that's very helpful. Um, let me turn to the, the role of foreign influence because your experience in Russia and Ukraine, 
obviously there's a lot of talk about foreign influence in the U.S. election. Any similarities you see behind the tactics that are used to influence elections um, the way Russia did in Ukraine or Russia doing in, in the U.S. now? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, no, of course, there are a whole set of um, electoral manipulation techniques that are proper to uh, American politics. Um, certain attempts at gerrymandering, um, right? Uh, certain techniques of voter suppression um, have been, you know, devised and are used, and I think are homegrown, as far as I understand. Um, that having been said, um, uh, there is ample evidence of uh, at least not necessarily the method of transmission of these techniques, but that these techniques are virtually identical um, to what we see um, uh, in Eastern Europe, I think is, you know, is indisputable. Unfortunately, I think because Americans, we, we lack a context for this and information about how this is done elsewhere, we may be sometimes misreading um, what's being said. So, you know, for example, um, when the president makes claims about um, ballot fraud through mail-in voting, um, the media takes this as, you know, quote unquote, a lie, right? Like um, it's interpreted as a lie rather than as uh, an announcement or a reference or a threat, right? Because while it is the case that mail, that, um, you know, fraud connected to uh, mailed in ballots in the United States historically has been exceedingly rare, um, right? As far as I understand, uh, in Russia and Ukraine, it's a staple of how elections are manipulated. Um, and we can apply this logic to any number of other tactics that have been invoked, um, uh, threatened, mentioned, whatever, um, in, the, in the Twitter feed. I think secondly, um, one thing we do need to realize is that so-called foreign interference is not really necessarily separable from the other stuff, right? So on the one hand, um, you know, so the election consultants, right, who set up these tools of manipulation, we need to see as transnational actors. Um, some of them, like Paul Manafort, are Americans, but they operate in a variety of national environments, including our own. And so there's learning and there's transmission of uh, techniques. Um, there's not necessarily a trace of this, but we may see an indication of this in the similarity of the techniques um, that, are, that are used. Um, I guess I would also point to a similarity, not just in the tactics, but in the method of communication of the tactics, right? So um, the way that the president communicates by signaling and sort of very, and signaling these very specific techniques are also typical of the way in which uh, Eastern European and other um, international uh, politician, politicians uh, signal their supporters to behave um, in, in certain ways. Great, thanks. I want to turn to um, some of our students. Um, we've got several students here from the, the Schwartz Center for Economic Policy Analysis, um, who, like uh, others, have been following the election very closely and trying to understand what the election means for economic policy moving forward. Um, but I want to turn to see if they have any questions that they might, um, they might ask. Hi, uh, well, thank you so much for the, for the interesting talk. And I think it, it's an interesting um, kind of way of shifting the conversation that um, we've kind of been used to in terms of what our domestic news media posits as, as election interference and things like that. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm curious, I mean, I, I feel like so much of the media conversation is dominated by yeah, the, the idea of foreign interference and the idea of, of disinformation and, and, um, and I, my sense is that your focus is, is broader than that and focusing on the institutions, the actual material realities um, of, of how these institutions interact. And I feel like there's been less attention on that, even though there've been, you know, people making noise about, you know, Donald Trump's big signature on the uh, stimulus check and things like that. Um, but I'm curious uh, what your thoughts are on why that is, why there's been so much more focus on these factors of social media, you know, Facebook ads and things like that, and less so on the material and institutional realities that can influence the elections. Thanks, that's a great question. Um, I think I could, I could point to at least sort of two reasons that we might think, that we might think about here. Um, 
One of them uh, is methodological, right? Um, understanding and even just observing these kinds of tactics um, requires um, social science methodology that uh, emphasizes um, grounded contextual on the ground research, right? Um, you are not gonna find, find uh, because first of all, traces in the documentary record may be rare. Um, and second of all, because um, these type of techniques don't show up, uh, right, uh, in um, numerical indices uh, in general, right? Um, it's, uh, it's, it's very difficult to study if you're not aware of the contextual reality. So I, when an example I can, I can give you of this, this methodological problem, right? If we wanna look at Ukrainian politics, for example, for decades, um, American media and even scholars, right, would describe Ukraine as a divided country. You may be familiar with this, this narrative, a polarized country in which the West is pro-Europe and the East is pro-Russia. Um, this narrative was preceded in many ways from examination of voting outcomes, right, electoral outcomes, which showed preference for pro-Western candidates in the West and preference for pro-Russia candidates in the East. What they didn't show um, was the relationship between uh, those electoral outcomes and um, the sort of structure of economic relations in the country, wherein um, the heavily industrialized um, East and South, in part, was voting for pro, so-called pro-Russia candidates, not because that's what people thought, but because it was easier uh, to manipulate um, voting behavior in those areas than it was in the West. And so um, the story that emerged out of methodologies that did not examine people's everyday experiences was actually wrong. And in fact, in some ways, um, repeated and amplified Kremlin narratives about a divided Ukraine. Um, once uh, Russia got involved in the East and in Crimea, then we started to see things shift and that the picture of people's um, preferences emerged more fully. Uh, but I would say that there's a, there's a methodological reason for all of this. It simply requires um, a lot more legwork um, to see uh, some of these techniques if they're being used. The second reason um, I think uh, simply has to do with the fact that it's been a struggle to, um, to get people to understand uh, because of the position of the American executive leadership at the moment, uh, what happened um, in terms of the foreign interference. Um, you know, it, there are maybe other things going on, but I also think that, and I'm talking about other things with you today, but we don't wanna lose sight either. The fact that, you know, our electoral system was attacked and it was attacked by Russian state actors. You know, we can debate how effective that interference was. We can discuss the sort of fine points of the precise nature of the relationship between say Russian hackers and trolls and the Russian state security apparatus. And we can critique party platforms, but there's no ambiguity about the fact that the Russian state attacked American elections. Um, and I say this as someone who speaks Russian, you know, loves Russian literature and sings along with songs by Didete and Nishasne Slutchi and instinctively puts bottles on the floor when they're empty. Um, this is not about identity politics. This is not a partisan issue. Um, this happened. Uh, and because there's been um, arguably uh, some obstruction um, at the top, it's been hard to get people to understand, pay attention to it. I, I appreciate that point about just the legwork that needs to happen to, to do this. Um, and I kind of wonder if, you know, you alluded to this earlier, but, you know, in a time of COVID, um, gold pandemic, does that give more tools to the incumbent? It sounds like it, it does, um, but would be curious about your perspective. Yeah, I mean, I think it certainly opens the door to the possibility um, in, in many ways. Um, you know, in some ways the, well, and this is what I argue in, in my book uh, about uh, electoral interference in or electoral manipulation in Russia and Ukraine, um, it's precisely the, um, the economic chaos of the 1990s, uh, right? That makes possible um, this shift in the social contract and the sort of abrogation of the post-war uh, social contract, right? Which existed in, in the former Soviet Union as well um, of sort of welfare state, um, uh, people having a feeling that they had a right to expect certain things um, from the government. Um, 
that ruptured uh, in the 1990s in a way that is sort of eerily similar to what's happening right now um, with the pandemic, right? I mean, millions of people lose their jobs overnight, borders close, um, internal borders close or are tightened. Um, people no longer have access to many of to education, healthcare, a lot of the things that they sort of had taken for granted and opportunistic politicians come in and, and then uh, use those things as a cudgel uh, to, to, uh, to get what they want. Um, now, opportunity is not the same thing as capacity, right? So uh, although the pandemic offers really a fabulous opportunity to those who would like to um, manipulate American elections uh, from uh, the seat of incumbency, it's not clear to me uh, at the moment whether um, whether the even if the will exists, whether the capacity exists, it requires a, you know it requires a party machine. It requires organizational resources. Um, it requires um, you know a, a sort of an, a, an attempt at governance that I'm not sure that this presidential administration has um, demonstrated. So uh, so certainly they could. Whether they they will is a, is a different question. Great, thanks. I think we've got a question from one of our students. You will. Hello, Dr. Pisano. Uh, my name is Yoel Gerenko. I'm a research assistant at SIPA. I am also a second year MA student and I have a quick question for you. First of all, thank you for being here. I just wanted to reference your earlier comment about uh, the elections e exhibited in Eastern Europe and perhaps in the United States as being about changing, uh, not changing minds, but about changing voting behavior. And I wanna to talk to you for a quick second about what can be done to push back against that, at least in the context of American elections. So referencing a, a paper actually put out in August by the Transition Integrity Project, which seems to me a, a very interesting document, they have provided four specific recommendations uh, as to what individuals can do as to basically secure the uh, outcomes of the American elections. Included in these recommendations are plan for a contested election, focus on readiness in states, address two of the biggest threats head on, lies about voter fraud and escalating violence, and anticipate Iraqi administrative transition. Now, in my mind's eye, these are good and well uh, in terms of uh, addressing the 2020 elections, but they don't speak to any, uh, they don't speak at least in a significant way to structural matters insofar as um, the Senate supporting certain uh, electoral uh, shifts in regard to changing behavior, not minds, that coming from the, the current administration, at least plainly in my view. So what can be done on a broader level over the next five years, 10 years, 20 years, in order to ensure that elections in the future are not about changing voting behavior, but about changing minds with respect to actual political issues? Thank you. This is really a, a very, very important question. Um, if we look at the experience of Eastern experiences of Eastern Europe and try to learn from them, one of the things that we can observe is that techniques of electoral manipulation are not um, constant over time. They are. Uh, they evolve. There's learning, and their use depends partly on opportunistic politicians who come along and you know, want to put them into place, but they mainly depend on the existence of structural factors, underlying factors that make it possible for those politicians to come along and um, manipulate elections if they choose to do so. We saw this in Ukraine in which what some scholars interpreted as a sort of um, pendulum between uh, democracy and authoritarianism in the first uh, decade and a half or so of the 21st century um, arguably could be interpreted differently, which is to say that there are these basic structural conditions exist and certain when certain politicians decided to use them, um, then we saw um, a tendency toward authoritarianism. I think we can identify a similar pattern perhaps emerging in American politics as well. Um, and if we want to ensure that elections remain about choice and not about obligation, that they remain as a, about expressing preferences and not merely an expression of, of obedience or behavior, um, then we need to address economic inequality. 
right? We need to address the structural conditions that, um, that make this manipulation possible. So inequality is one of them. Um, these techniques also thrive in environments where there is an overlap between um, a political and economic uh, power. Now, you might say, right, where essentially paymasters are also in charge of electoral processes. Now, one interpretation of that um, observation could be a sort of Hayekian move, right? It could be, well, then we need to take the, uh, take the politics out of the economy. We need to privatize everything. We need to make sure that these spheres are separate. What the 2000s show us in Eastern Europe, and an important lesson I think for Americans also to um, absorb, is that when you do that, you actually make the electoral problem worse. Right, so, in, so one of the things that we can observe in Eastern Europe is that many of the tools that politicians used, incumbent politicians used to manipulate people's preferences were to offer them crumbs in, um, in exchange for something they had recently lost, right? So a sort of common example in rural areas um, would be that people would receive these sort of sacks of, of uh, cereals of grain um, at election time, um, ostensibly in return for their vote. And this got interpreted even in, uh, in local media in, in Eastern Europe and in, in Russia in particular um, and in Ukraine as a payment for their vote. But what this grain actually was, was, um, was what people were due already for uh, the use of their land that had been privatized and sort of uh, seized by, uh, by local agricultural bosses. And so um, what got uh, sort of interpreted as a payoff was really something that people uh, had recently lost through enclosure, um, was really something that people lost th through some of the processes that are typical of contemporary capitalism, right? And so um, when we look at the basic structural conditions that allow electoral manipulation, which mainly are an overlap between political and economic uh, power, we have to be careful to assume that, um, that privatization and sort of so-called neoliberal reforms are the answer here because usually they're not. Those create more inequality um, and uh, make people render people more um, vulnerable to the predations of opportunistic uh, incumbent politicians. Um, so, so I think those are some of the things that we need, we need to address. Um, you know, a basic income, um, universal access to healthcare, um, with an an apolitical bureaucracy of the type that we traditionally have in this country um, are things that could be done to ensure that um, that that these type of uh, electoral manipulations don't happen. But first, we have to get past this election um, because it's become abundantly clear that if if um, if the current incumbents remain in office, uh, I I do not think we will have a competitive election next time. I think that's a really important point, the connection between economic inequality and their economic systems and the political inequality and political systems. Um, I know people here at the Short Center do spend a lot of time thinking about economic inequality, um, but the linkages between economic inequality and the political side, I think are incredibly important because they reinforce each other. Um, the politics reinforces the economics, economics reinforces the politics. Um, but it's really interesting to hear that the, um, the reforms you mentioned uh, separating the private and public sectors um, increases the odds that you have more manipulation in the electoral system. Um, I think that's an important point that is, is not oftentimes recognized. Um, let me kind of pick up on something you said about this current election. Um, what worries you the most? What worries me the most? Uh, there are many possibilities here. Um, I think one of the things that worries me is um, even uh, if uh, we have an outcome that reflects um, people's preferences, um, I'm concerned that records will be destroyed. Um, I'm concerned that we're not going to have a way to um, contend in the future uh, with, or even understand uh, what happened here, right? We have a presidential administration that's already known for um, not observing um, guidelines uh, regarding the preservation of presidential records, notes, and so forth. Um, and uh, yeah, regardless of what happens in the short term, I'm, I'm concerned about the historical record. 
um, at the moment. Um, so, so that's one thing um, I'm worried about. I also would say that I'm worried about um, people taking on uh, accusations of fraud uh, by those who are committing fraud. Um, I, I really cannot emphasize enough that the lessons of Eastern Europe show us that the tactics that I've been talking about today are the tactics of incumbency. They are not available to the opposition. Um, the Democratic Party does not have available to it it, the organizational resources to execute the type of fraud that um, the president is sort of announcing. Whereas um, the same cannot be true of, um, uh, of, the, um, of the GOP um, at the moment. So, um, so I think Americans really, and international observers also need to be uh, very aware of, um, of what is possible when uh, evaluating claims that may be circulating post-election about uh, who may be trying to deceive uh, the population of the United States. Um, yeah. yeah. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, there is a lot to worry about, unfortunately, at, at the moment. Um, let me finish this up with a personal question. So you were on the ground in Eastern Europe when there is active manipulation in this way happening. Did you ever think you'd be applying that knowledge to a US election? Unfortunately, um, takes me back to a paper presentation I made 20 years ago um, about, uh, about these techniques, which were emerging at the time, but not yet recognized uh, outside of um, Ukraine, outside of Russia. Um, in which I actually made the point that the United States is, uh, is a ripe environment uh, for this type of um, manipulation because we have institutions like mega churches um, and you know, other social institutions that, um, that in which political and economic communities overlap, right? In which um, we, can, we can point to many other types of social institutions and practices. Um, the United States is a place where, where, um, where these spheres of influence um, are, are really tightly imbricated and that leaves us open, I think. This is, again, these structural factors leaves us open to this type of manipulation. I recall when I raised this possibility 20 years ago, um, uh, it was uh, met with um, laughter. Um, and I think um, one of the things that uh, Americans may be learning the hard way um, is that um, our ideas about exceptionalism when it comes to our political, social, and economic institutions, if not our ideas, uh, um, maybe need, need to be re-examined. Great, thanks. Um, maybe one last question, uh, maybe on an up, up note. Um, what can we do um, as an academic community, as teachers, as students, and as members of the broader US uh, population, what can we do to help ensure that we don't um, mark that, march down a path where this becomes routine? Well, um, first of all, it, it may be too late uh, for the short term. And I think we need to be honest about that um, and recognize it. Um, I'll introduce uh, as a sort of, May, maybe a way of thinking about this, um, the idea that uh, a number of people in Russia have really um, sort of thought about and activated um, in conditions in which there is no political choice or competition at the polls. And that is the idea that we need to keep alive the idea of choice in our lives. We need to practice the idea of choice in our everyday, everyday lives. Um, of making decisions, of making selections in order to maintain that conceptual apparatus um, that then can be um, put back into play when uh, formal institutions of politics permit it. So that's, that's one thing. Second is there may be reasons to be a little bit more optimistic here. One of the things that we see in Eastern Europe in the last 30 years is a type of mimesis, right? A type of imitation and a type of attempt to sort of um, uh, create a mise-en-scene of democratic institutions, right? Um, performing democracy while not necessarily practicing democracy. 
one could argue that the current presidential administration in the United States is performing a sort of mirror mimesis, right? There is an attempt to embody authoritarianism. There's an attempt to perform a liberalism. Whether or not the society accepts and goes along with that is a big question. And so I could imagine a situation in which we have a sort of veneer of autocratic rule, but in which American society remains committed to and remembers what democratic practice looks like. Um, so I think this is this is the challenge for us, all, all of us in our everyday lives. And this is the long game. This is not about this particular election. Addressing structural economic inequalities and maintaining um, memory uh, and transmitting memory of what it means to think, deliberate, and choose, I think is, is sort of the way forward for, for all of us now. I really like that, uh, maintaining the, the idea of, of choice. Um, and, and we have a choice. Um, for some of us, it's next Tuesday. And for some of us, it's maybe last Tuesday, if you did early voting or mail-in voting. Um, so um, Professor Pisano, thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, it's been enormously helpful in how to think about um, the current U.S. context, but also the longer run, what the long run trajectory looks like of our politics and our economics, um, inequalities and, and authoritarianism and, and all this set of issues that we're dealing with today. So, so thank you very much. Thank you so much for the invitation and for your participation and for your wonderful questions. Thank you, Professor, for joining. Thanks thank for you so question. much. Thank you. Thank you. Right, thank you, everyone, for joining us.